Thank you, y'all. Brenna, thank you. My word. She's got in ears in. <laughs> Brenda can't hear me. I'm not going to take that personally. Uh, let her know. I said, thank you. Harvest, how we doing? We doing okay? My goodness. Uh, I hope this doesn't get normal for you. Just the, the opportunity that we have to come together. The moments where God will unexpectedly show up and just say, hey, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, my word, I believe he has plans for us this morning. I hope you feel the same. Uh, okay, so Pierce mentioned that I am a Woodlands kid. All right, does anybody else claim that? Like, I'm a Woodlands person. This is like my town. I've been here a while. Anybody else? Help me out. You've been here a while? Anybody? Okay, because some people might come here and throw around the term Woodlands kid. Let me demonstrate some things, okay? I used to get my burgers at Ruby Begonia's. I used to, I used to get my pizza at Chubby Bumpkins. Anybody? We're going back decades here. You're like, that's a weird name. That might be why it doesn't exist anymore, but the pizza was good. I, I remember snow cone tickets after the Little League game at Orwall. Anybody? Yeah. Bubble gum or grape were the two best, in my opinion, based off scientific study. I used to chase the Goodyear blimp across the playground in the sky at Sally K. Ride Elementary School. Anybody remember the blimp? Yeah, okay. So just put my credentials on the table. Uh, if I come in with some extra gusto um, or some just, gosh, some extra exhortation, it's because I love this area. I love this city. Um, this is the city that raised me. And as much as I'm thankful uh, to be a product of this town, I'm just as thankful, more thankful to be a product of this house. Uh, when, when a kid goes away for a while, you send them away for a while, and then they come back, the proper thing to do is look at some pictures. Is it okay if I show you a few? Let me do this. Um, that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, I, I, I felt sent uh, by the Lord and by this community to go play in a church in Seattle in 2010. And uh, we just relocated back in Texas. But first, let me just establish the roots here in this community. Uh, this first quick picture I want to show you is the last youth event that I was a part of planning uh, when I was a youth pastor at Rebel Base just across the parking lot. And it was called Reach Weekend. So this is now called Forge. Some of your kids, some of you have been to Forge, which is an incredible thing where God moves in the lives of students. Uh, historically, it was called Disciple Now. Anybody know about Disciple Now? That, that word means something to you? So in 1998, at that event is where I first encountered the gospel and gave my life to Jesus. In this church, in this house, at that event. And so it changed everything for me. We can pray for Brian's salvation. We can clap for that. That's great. Um, but changed my life. And so in that picture, let me throw it back up there just for a second. Uh, you can see, oh, here we go. It's on this one. Uh, the, the, the word in the back is reach. That, that's what is now called Forge was called Reach Weekend. Uh, the planning team, uh, our youth team came together and said, hey, let's give this D-Now a new name. And reach to us meant, man, we want to reach out to God in worship. We want to reach out to one another in community and mission, all because God has reached out to us through the gospel. And I was like, yeah, let's run with that. Let's do that. Um, and God saw fit to see things grow in that season. It was beautiful to be a part of. And the two churches that we planted in Seattle that are thriving in one of the least church places in the country are both called Reach. Um, preaching the gospel and just doing good in the city of Seattle in different neighborhoods. And uh, largely this community's fingerprints are all over it. And so from a guy, many of you have no idea who I am. Just know that the community that you were a part of is, uh, has influenced me greatly. Uh, excuse me, greatly. I am grateful. And uh, there are people in Seattle that are grateful as well for this place. So what a legacy and what an opportunity we have. Uh, so a couple more pictures. This is so the, the heart here. This is at Memorial Herman. That is my first son. I have five kids now. And this baby is turning 15 today. So I'm going to be getting in the car. <laughs> yeah, pretty crazy. Uh, that is Julia Lockridge on the right uh, on Woodlands Methodist staff. And Shannon and Casey, some incredible students from back in the day. Uh, and then just to show you how old school I am, this is Market Street. Right after Market Street opened, this is what responsible parenting looks like. Take notes. <laughs> uh, and if you're wondering how old and irrelevant am I, uh, the Black Eyed Peas were a big deal at this time. So uh, pretty hilarious. So Market Street, uh, pretty great. Um, I want to give you a quick glimpse of this one because I know who's in this room. Just bear with me. This picture is really special to me. That is Matt Carter and Scott Pollock. Anybody know who those people are? Those are products of this house as well. Man, only a handful of people, but these are uh, two teaching pastors, incredible people who are on staff at this church that were on the advisory team for our church plant in Seattle. So Woodlands Methodist relationships and support, uh, man, were a huge reason why we saw so much fruit over 11 years leading 
Reach Church in Seattle. Uh, but let's talk about what I'm doing now. Let's do this quickly. Uh, I'm leading something called Breakaway in College Station, Texas, on campus at Texas A&M University. Um, it is incredible. 1989, a man named Greg Mott started a Bible study in his living room, in his apartment living room in College Station, just for his friends. And it had this Acts of the Apostles type impact that at one point people were packed out in the living room and sitting on the steps going down outside the apartment just so they can hear the teaching coming through the windows of this Bible study. Fast forward 35 years and I have been entrusted with a Bible study that meets inside Reed Arena where the basketball team plays. Every Tuesday, you will find between 2,000 and 7,000 college students coming together to worship Jesus, study the Bible, and be sent to live lives of purpose and mission in their area and in their generation. There's nothing like it in the country. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's truly ridiculous. Um, and, and please just pray for us. We feel like we've been handed the keys to a Ferrari and we kind of like know how to drive to like Randall's and back, you know, or like H-E-B and back. And we're learning like, Lord, what, what is the potential you've planted in this movement and how do you want to use this all the more to impact a generation? Um, I come with great news. Uh, the news of like the hopelessness of Gen Z has been greatly exaggerated, Okay. <laughs> You need to know this. If you have been spending time rolling your eyes or worried or writing off Gen Z for whatever reason, I, I, what a blessing I get to tell you that you're wrong. The, God is moving in this generation. You have no idea. Some of you might have kids or grandkids in that space. The Lord is stirring up a hunger in our young adults that it aligns with our greatest needs as the American church right now, just so you know. Um, a couple years ago, Barna put out a study saying that Christianity has reached the place of irreparable decline in America, just going off of statistics. Unless, and are you glad there's an unless, right? Unless two things happen. One, the multiplication of healthy churches. How wonderful that Woodlands Methodist has a vision for this, right? Like this is starting to happen. New campuses, new churches, resources. We need more churches, more communities of faith like this one. And the second one, a move of God, a move of the Holy Spirit among young people, among young adults, specifically college students. It is happening. Pray for it. Pray for it all the more. Pray for it. And it's not just at A&M. It's, it's popping up at Auburn and Florida State and like Asbury. Like all, it's, st it's starting with college students. So please don't even jokingly write off this generation. Pray for them. Resource them. Mentor them. We need you in the game because God is sparking something that I don't think we've seen before right now. That is my news from my Gen Z outpost. There's a lot to get excited about, to resource, to give to, to pray for, uh, that might just mean we get to see things that the generations before us have been praying for for a long time. So I'm not just trying to hype you up. That's what's happening right now in the world. Um, and that's where we're at. I gotta show you one more picture before I pick up the pace. And you're gonna, you're gonna jog this through with me as we go through a bunch of Bible today. Uh, one more picture, this is Mount Rainier. Anybody been to Mount Rainier before? Seattle, anybody seen this? It's like me and four people, high five, that's great. <laughs> um, it's the tallest mountain in the lower 48. Absolutely breathtaking. I know there's a lot more Colorado connections and ski trips in this room than, than Mount Rainier ones, but imagine if like your favorite Colorado mountain peak was literally reach out and touch it close to Denver. That's what Rainier feels to Seattle. Like the glory is ridiculous. So that picture I just showed you, sometimes you are in Pike Place Market watching them throw fish around and like hand out fresh, fresh flowers in Pike Place Market, downtown Seattle. And then across Puget Sound with ferries going by, there's Rainier in all her glory. And it's just overwhelming to behold. It is just God's best handiwork, completely glorious. Here's the crazy thing about Rainier. One, always there, right? Mountains don't move a lot but you would often think not there. If you're unaware, it can get kind of, get kind of gray in Seattle once in a while. Uh, in fact, nine months a year, you can go weeks and weeks without seeing, you go months without seeing Rainier, and what's crazy is every spring getting into the summertime, Rainier comes out, and the locals will be like, dude, Rainier's coming out today. Like, we, look at, like we can see it, and no joke, not just the visitors, not just the tourists, the locals all freeze when the glory that has always been there 
but has been concealed for a season comes back, okay? So I'm preaching already a little bit, and this is just, this is just a nugget that might be the small piece some of you need to hear. If it's felt like God has been hidden for a season, and getting in the room, getting in the car and getting in this room and finding your seat today took effort because it's felt like you've been going through the motions for a God you're not even sure is there anymore. I-, I want you to know he is closer than you think. And I'll show you a picture of a mountain a couple thousand miles away to tell you that. He's closer than you think, he is always there. Secondly, mountains have an idea of calling around them in Seattle. People are very ha- passionate about hiking and climbing in Seattle. In the absence of like traditional religion, that's the, that's the religion. It's like, but do you go hiking? Like, and you're just constantly being judged, like, nah, man, I'm a basketball player, and I don't know, I don't, don't do a lot of hiking. Um, they judge you. But what you see bumper stickers on all the, mostly Subarus, but a lot of different cars in Seattle, the bumper sticker you see is, the mountains are calling and I must go. Which I think might be a Robert Frost quote, I'm not entirely sure. But uh, the mountains are calling and I must go. Rainier, you just look at her, hiker, climber or not, you feel this like primal, internal draw, like I, I'm supposed to go to that, touch, experience that. There's a calling attached to it. That's the second reason I'm showing you a picture of a mountain. The third one is this word that I think sums up by my observation what is happening in the harvest, what is happening in the Woodlands Methodist Church, and what is happening in the American church in this moment, but especially right here. It's the word base camp. I've been to base camp at Rainier before. It doesn't require like expertise to get to base camp. If you can hike up a hill for a little while um, and not quit, you can experience base camp. And you get to base camp on the tallest mountain in the lower 48, and there are teams of people from all over the world speaking all kinds of languages getting ready to go to the summit. And there is a buzz in base camp. There's a bunch of people, there's like, you walk down the path and there's snow tents on either side and there's people laughing and meeting each other using Google Translator to like communicate with each other. There's this common sense of purpose. We're all gonna make it to the summit as we each take our turns to leave this place. But base camp itself, it's like people with a sense of purpose united in their gaze and what they're looking at and what they aspire to. Base camp has a buzz among a bunch of people who are about to be sent. That's what's happening in this place by observation. Through the relationships I have with your leaders. By the way, I'm 60 miles down the road keeping an eye on the community that saved me, raised me, developed me, and sent me. Like, that's the word. I feel like it's the buzz of base camp. God is already sending and is preparing to send this place. You are in a study of one of the most powerful books ever written in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, You should not read this book casually it might mess you up. It might mess your life up. As you start realizing these are not fairy tales, this is our history, this is our heritage, and these are stories and resources that might be a little bit more prescriptive than we thought. It's safer to think they're descriptive, but maybe there's some prescriptive things in there. Not just stories, but maybe reminders of like the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, the same spirit that empowered Peter to see 5,000 people saved the day after Pentecost, after he's healing people in the temple square, the same spirit that's like inspiring non-seminary educated people to magically become like bold, passionate witnesses. What if that same Holy Spirit is trying to leap off the pages of a book into a community's heart in the Woodlands, Texas, to be a part of what he's doing in the world? What if that's the case? Sent by King Jesus is the series. Here's my game plan for the next, ooh, I'm not behaving very well yet when I look at the clock. Uh, For the next 15 to 20 minutes, if you'll come with me for the journey, okay? If you'll come with me for the journey, I wanna populate a list quickly of items. It's my exhortation to the church community I love. What to expect when sent by King Jesus. We're gonna fly through more scripture than you're probably used to. I'm like the deep dive, let's ring the truth out of three Bible verses guy. We're gonna go a chapter, all right? And you're up for it. Uh, If you're a note taker, I challenge you, focus on the nine quick points. There's nine points, Brian, you serious? Yes, I'm gonna keep the pace up, I promise. 
Focus on the nine points. Let me, don't try to follow along. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be a little bit brisk for that. But I believe that the Lord, instead of having one thing and you just circle around it for a half hour, some of these things to expect are going to prepare you well, are going to exhort and encourage and excite you effectively for what it would look like if you dedicated your entire life to living sent by King Jesus to be a part of what he's doing in the world. What to expect if you go all in. That's what I have for you. Um, I refuse to let you settle for the buzz of base camp. There's a summit to be experienced. There are things to see up there you can see nowhere else. There are deeper relationships when you are taking the mountain together with the people around you and with the one guiding you that you do not get at base camp. There's more. You're being beckoned upward and onward, Harvest. Here's nine things to expect as you set out together. The first one we see in Acts chapter four where Pastor Mark left off last week with the, um, with the gate called Beautiful and what happened there. I'm gonna read this passage. The rest I'm gonna dance through and you're gonna keep up, okay? But this one says this. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the net proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Number one, for the note takers, the first thing you should expect if sent by King Jesus is peculiar unity. Peculiar unity. Like unity that goes way beyond anything that any of us have experienced or seen before. Verse 32 says they were of one heart and one soul. Like the imagery there is that this, this community's heart beat in unison for the things that King Jesus cares about most. They were united among these things, heart and soul united, and then the part that jumps off the page, you're like, is this about to be a giving sermon? We didn't expect that from the guest preacher, but there's some radical generosity taking place here. And yes, there's, there's a mentality that I believe is absolutely supposed to be prescriptive, Okay. A mentality, not the practice of everyone needs to go sell their stuff and bring it immediately. I'm not making a case for Christian communism right now, okay? That's not the point. But what many would say forced generosity for the greater good is communism, joyful, voluntary generosity to a radical degree for the good of your family, brothers and sisters, that just might be called Christianity, okay? And so the radical generosity is meant to be uh, the foremost tangible picture of this united heart and soul. There will be no needy among us. And that will be a radically evangelistic, a radically missional thing about our community is nobody has needs. Because we've all been loved by Jesus radically and so we love each other in a somewhat radical way as well. No one's gonna have needs in our community. That's wild to me, this peculiar unity. I gotta quickly pause here and tell you that when I was in Seattle, we had a whole bunch of employees of Microsoft that were part of our church. And we made the dangerous decision to study the book of Acts. And we spent months and months going through the book of Acts and we got to these parts and we're like, we're just gonna try to actually apply and implement the things that we read together. Everybody in? Like, yeah, let's go for it. So that means we're gonna be open to the Holy Spirit in new ways. And that means we're gonna pray a lot more than we used to. And that means we're gonna have eyes for our city like missionaries, even though only a few of us are paid by the church to be like professional Christian folk, right? And one of the things was this concept. And we're like, how do we do this? And so my Microsoft tech friends in the church were like, we'll start a website. That's how we'll change the world. That's how we'll apply the Bible. <laughs> we'll start a website. And dead serious, we started a page on our website called Have a Need, Meet a Need. And anybody from the community could go on and be like, hey, um, just so, so if you, hey, like there's the I have a need side. And this was everything from college students that were like unexpected things happened in my family. There was a mistake in this area, whatever. I'm now 6,000 behind on tuition and I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I, in humility, I just put that before you for prayer and whatever, however you might wanna step in, right? And there was like, I'm a single mom and my car broke down and I don't know what to do. Or there's all, anything you can imagine on the have a need side. 
And then on the meet a need side, primarily it was people coming to find out what need they might be able to help with. But sometimes it was proactive, like, hey, this is crazy to tell a bunch of strangers, but if housing is an issue for you because of unforeseen for circumstances, one of my rental properties just became available and I can totally hold this open for a couple months for somebody in the family if they need a roof over their head. Proactively putting things out there, bringing it to the apostles' feet, if you will. Y'all, in our little church plant of a couple hundred people, like hundreds of thousands of dollars swapped hands over the course of a couple years. Like very organically. And new relationships happened, and the reason I bring it up is not just to say, hey, this is doable. It's to tell you that people at Microsoft met Jesus because they were so confounded by the stories in the cafeteria about the radical generosity among their coworkers. That's the point. That's the point. Peculiar unity. Number two, in that thing we already read, you should expect powerful proclamation. If you study this paragraph, you see an example of the generosity, then you see another chunk about the example of the generosity and how it worked, and in the middle, there's a one-line descriptor. They were proclaiming and witnessing about the Lord's resurrection with great power and effectiveness. Somehow they're connected. Somehow they're connected. At least the credibility for the proclamation came from the generosity, but in some way, I can't quite like, articulate. There's some like, supernatural power, I think, between these two concepts, that people who are radically loving and radically giving, I don't know, it just works in tandem with the word proclaimed to soften hearts and cause people to lean in a little bit more. Expect powerful proclamation. Expect to see it. Expect to witness it. Expect to be invited into it. And here's the hard part. Expect to practice it yourself if you're gonna say that you're a sent one. Expect the Holy Spirit to empower you in that way powerful proclamation. The third thing huh, that we see is actually in the next chunk of scripture in chapter five. It's immediate opposition, okay? So we just saw powerful proclamation, peculiar unity. The Lord is moving in these crazy ways. Immediate opposition. You get into chapter five, there's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah, somebody just said, uh-oh, in the fourth row because they know the story. It's a wild story. It feels like it's out of place. Like It feels like an Old Testament story just plopped into the middle of the book of Acts. Because what happens is, there's a married couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and you start reading, and it sounds like it's gonna be just like the Levite who came and donated the proceeds from his sold field. Ananias and Sapphira, they apparently sell a property, and they bring it, and they put their stuff at the feet of the, disciple, the apostles as well. Everything's beautiful, right? Like, well, no, apparently these two contrived together that they were gonna try to appear like they were giving everything, and they were going to claim that they were giving all the proceeds, but really, they were going to hold some back out of self-preservation, um, lack of trust in the Lord, and, and lie about it to try to make it look like they were doing that, and they come and they bring their offering, and then they drop dead. Okay, yeah, right? Um, they drop dead, and it's like this super heavy story, and you're like, why... Can't the Holy Spirit maybe grade on a curve here? Like, what is happening in this story? Is it really, is the takeaway that someday it's gonna be like, make sure you're giving everything to the church or God might kill you. If that ever happens here, you call me in College Station, I will correct the theology immediately, okay? But no, guys, here's the point. Here's why this is such a harsh moment, such an important moment. This was spiritual infiltration. This action was completely contrary not just to the financial pra uh, practices, but to the spirit of the moment and the movement. The, okay, so picture Satan, our very real enemy, who is frantic at this point in redemptive history. He thought he scored some kind of victory at the cross. Clearly, that was not the case. The resurrection was a death blow to the enemy's agenda forever. But he's trying to do as much damage as he can, almost kamikaze style, until he's gone, right? So he's trying to maximize damage to God's heart and God's people. So imagine him the way a general would be standing at like that table in the movies where they're looking at the map, thinking strategically like, okay, how do I do as much damage to the movement and the moment as possible? I will attack their unity. I will attack their unity. That is gonna be the primary evangelistic tool for the next 200, 300 years of Christian history. I'm gonna attack the unity. How do I do that? I'm going after the generosity. 
and I'm going to woo Ananias and Sapphira. I'm gonna give them the opportunity to side with me in this moment, and they do. And that is what happens in this place. Immediate spiritual opposition. He's saying, can I create enough hypocrisy in this moment for the gospel to drown in? To take away the credibility and snuff out the movement before it can really go Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. My friends, community and generosity and unity will always be opposed. Your personal efforts, listen to me, Harvest, your personal efforts to take any meaningful step forward in practically following Jesus with your everything, being sent by him, is going to be opposed as well. And it's a joy for me to tell you that, not because it's some dire warning. I'm telling you, when a pathetic, defeated enemy opposes you as you're trying to take practical steps forward of living sent with Jesus, Expect it, recognize it, laugh at him, and say, nah, I'm good. I'm gonna keep moving forward. I'm gonna keep trusting the book. I'm gonna keep walking with my community. I'm gonna keep loving the way Jesus did sacrificially. And just so you know, may I remind you, sir, you lose in the end. You're on the clock. So my eyes are back on Jesus because I've been warned and I've been told to expect it. Immediate opposition will come. But guess what's on the other side of immediate opposition? Is number four. How did it go for that desperate attempt by the enemy with Ananias and Sapphira? Was it effective in slowing down the runaway train that is the kingdom of God? No, it was not. The fourth thing to expect, my friends, is defiant increase. Defiant increase. In Acts 5, 12 and 16, it says that many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. They're all together in Solomon's portico, still unified, um, and you, you're reading the rest of my favorite phrase in this passage in the middle of Acts 5 is all together and more than ever. They're still all together. He could not take their unity. So their superpower is intact through the Holy Spirit. And then it says more than ever. And I need you to find a way to first understand what more than ever is talking about and then adopt it as your hope and prayerful posture for the future. Because what is happening more than ever in Acts chapter five? People are being added to the family of God more than ever. People are experiencing healing of all kinds more than ever. People are being delivered from the effects of evil and the oppression of evil more than ever. And it is crazy to read this in Acts five. Have you been paying attention to Acts two, three, and four? That was kind of happening a lot already. People were being added by the thousands. Miraculous stuff happening like crazy, but Acts 5, more than ever, on the other side of the opposition, things go even crazier in the most beautiful, redemptive way. Do you ever pray prayers like that? I need you to pray prayers like that. There's too much potential in this community. God is moving too much. We are settling for the buzz of base camp when we stop praying more than ever prayers. Do you have any category for, I want God to move in the people around me in a way that I've never witnessed before? I, I want God to move in my community, in my place of work, on my street, in my neighborhood, in, on my block, in my region. I want God to move. I want it like all the stories we hear from the mission field or our grandparents who were around for some of these wild revivals or some of you who maybe got caught up in the Jesus movement or those who actually got to be in the room at Asbury seems just like the Lord move in undeniable ways. Y'all, the posture of our heart should be a Lord more than ever. Would you move that way? Would you bring that defiant increase into our community when our efforts to be sent by King Jesus are opposed more than ever, friends? That's my prayer for you. Are you praying it for one another? Are you praying it for one another? Number five, what to expect? Envious adversaries. I'll do this one quickly. In Acts 5, 17 and 18, the high priest comes as they are healing and preaching and all that again, and it says jealousy is the reason why they come and oppress even further on these disciples. Here's what's gonna happen if you actually choose to live sent by King Jesus. You are going to experience an intimacy with Jesus you did not know was possible. The same way that you kinda of get to know your dad better when you go to work with him. Does that make sense? Like, take your child to work day used to be a thing. I don't know if it is anymore. But 
I remember I did that one time, and it was like seeing my dad interact with the guys in the warehouse and the people in the office and on the phone with, you know, overseas, like seeing all of that, I was like, oh, I see a whole nother side of my father. And like he takes me in the warehouse and just lets me start sweeping a little bit with all the guys in the warehouse. And suddenly I feel closer to my dad because in a small, seemingly inconsequential way, I'm a part of what he's doing in the world. Some of you have not tapped into that level of intimacy with God yet because you've been terrified to actually be sent by him and join him on his mission. There's a level of intimacy that you can tap into. You're like, do you say I'm lacking something? You say, even though I know Jesus, I lack something? No, 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 you have everything if you're in Christ. I'm saying there's an intimacy with the Jesus who saved you, with the Father who loves you, that can be deepened if you go with him on the mission. Some of you have been avoiding being sent or any kind of that language, living like a local missionary or living like you actually wanna bring hope and healing and redemption into the world because it sounds awkward to you. It sounds costly. I will tell you, it will be awkward and costly to live sent by King Jesus at times. But in walking away from the invitation here, you are walking away from joy. You think you're avoiding awkwardness and you're leaving joy on the table. One of my prayers for Harvest is that this would be a season you go back and get your joy by living, accepting the invitation to live sent. When that happens, people will see you experience intimacy that they have not experienced before. They will see you uh, witnessing life change in the people around you in ways that they are not witnessing. Jealousy will be there. Expect it from the religious folk and have grace waiting for them. Have prayers waiting for them. Don't hit back when they accuse you of doing things for the wrong motives. Don't hit back at all. Be like, I man, I think you got this one wrong. Why don't you come with us? Come, come serve. Come see. Come and see is the response when they come after your motivations because they're jealous of the fruit they're seeing in your lives by being the sent person. Envious adversaries. Number six, divine assistance. You should expect divine even angelic assistance. In Acts 5, there's this moment where they're locked up and it seems like the gospel is locked up and the leaders of the movement are locked up. So surely the movement itself has been locked up, right? Wrong. Angel shows up and springs them from the slammer. Pretty wild. Two quick things you need to know about this, guys. Acts is the story of two primary things of the Holy Spirit working through his people. One is he makes people who are capable of some things better and bolder at those things. And number two, sometimes he just shows up and does the things you can't do at all. You have no choice. You have no chance at all. I'm not capable of that. I've hit a brick wall. I don't have the smarts or the resources to get through this wall to the people, the lost folks on the other side that you want in your family. I can't, and he shows up, just knocks down the wall. You're like, cool, let's go, right? That's what happens here in this story, and that will happen in harvests being sent story in the season to come. I just believe it. Expect divine assistance in the miraculous ways. Times when, hmm, yeah, times when a spontaneous offering won't fix the problem. The supernatural will come in and he'll empower his people in new ways and walls will fall. And obstacles between the people God has found and the people God is still seeking will fall. Expect the assistance to come in that miraculous way. Last one before the home stretch is you should expect gospel opportunity. You should expect gospel opportunity. There's this crazy exchange when they're being, when the disciples are arrested and they're trying to lock up the movement and the Pharisees and the, San, excuse me, the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin are like, how do we freaking stop this like Jesus movement? How do we do this? How do we just shut it down? How do we get it gone? And they're not sure what to do. They're thinking of all these like radical ways to just end it, but they're scared of the people. All this is happening and like they're coming after with accusations and they say, first of all, we have to admit, you have filled Jerusalem with the teaching of Jesus. So they can't deny what's happened. They, they, they acknowledge what's happening. And then they say this crazy ironic phrase. They say, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Hmm. You intend to bring this man's blood upon us. What they mean is an accusation. You're trying to, hey, you're trying to make us responsible for his death so that the people will hold us accountable for the murder of Jesus. Da, 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 da. They're like, mm, I think we are trying to bring the blood of Jesus upon you, but not in the way you're talking about. 
There's gospel opportunities, often in the moments of difficulty and opposition are where the greatest opportunities happen. Somebody will say or do something in their efforts to oppose you and what they've actually done is open the door for you to speak truth to them and show love to them. Where in this situation, oh, well, let's, let's talk about the blood of Jesus on you for a minute. And they go on to say, yeah, you did hang the son of man on a tree. But let me expand on that. Like Jesus came to live a perfect life that you and I could never live so that you don't have to. He did that on your behalf. And you did have him hung on a tree, but that was also the plan from before the foundation of the world to save people like us because Jesus died the death we deserve in our place for our sin because he loves us. So they turn this moment of opposition into a moment of sharing and proclamation and love. It's beautiful. You will have these opportunities, expect such opportunities to come into your life. When the opposition is coming, are you secure enough in the one who sent you to say, Holy Spirit, show me what is the opportunity in this moment? What they mean to harm me, help me respond with truth and love and an invitation into what you've invited me into. There will be gospel opportunities, Harvest. Have an eye for them. And lastly, lastly, if the long list is too much for your brain and it's probably too much for mine, numbers eight and nine go together and serve as the one thing you should walk with if you forget everything else. Number eight, what to expect is costly love. Costly love. Acts 5.40, when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. It says beat them in the ESV. Your translation might say something different. It might say scourge. It might say torture. It might say strike. But the commentators tend to agree this is likely the same punishment Jesus got before going to the cross. Romans said that 40 lashings was a death sentence. The Jewish people who were empowered to do some punishment, but they were not allowed to do executions without permission, their way around this, their loophole was to do the 40 lashings minus one. They give you 39 lashings. The apostles probably got that here. They didn't know when they opened their mouth to proclaim. They didn't know when they extended their hand to heal through the power of the Holy Spirit that there would be this kind of cost. But the love had a cost. And if you're investigating Christianity, kind of just clarify, Christianity is where we get our true and best definition of love. And Love is cost. There is no understanding practically of love without sacrifice. And Jesus shows us that and proves us that on the cross with what he's willing to do to love us. My friends, if you're gonna allow yourself to be truly sent by Jesus, you should expect costly love. You should expect to witness it. You should expect to invite to love that way. And you should, if the spirit is within you, expect you to love costly in a costly way. Costly love is number eight. And then number nine, my friends, is in Acts 5, 41 to 42. This is the end. It says, then they left the presence of the council. So they've just been beaten and scourged within an inch of their lives. They are limping, they are bleeding. They are not in good shape. They are leaning on each other, I assume, to even get out of this place of opposition and torture. But they are free. And in that space, in that state, they leave rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day, consistency. In the temple and from house to house, unity. They did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. Faithful boldness. Costly love for a priceless joy. You know the difference between something that's costly or expensive and something that's priceless, right? In, we don't have time for the illustration, but how about this? Always trade the expensive thing for the costly, or for the, for the priceless thing. Always trade the costly thing for the priceless thing. The priceless thing's worth more. The joy you will experience inexplicably when you let yourself be sent by Jesus is exponentially greater than the cost of loving like Jesus. And I can't make the math on that make sense. 
I can't go to the whiteboard and say, here's the deal. If you give up everything and you lay down your preferences and you choose to walk into awkwardness and you accept the certainty of coming opposition of some kind and you sign up for a sacrifice, maybe to the point of death, you will on the other side, despite losing everything, realize that you've also received everything and lost nothing. The math and the economics won't make sense, so I have to trust the Holy Spirit to just put it on your heart and be like, yeah, that kind of counterintuitive sacrificial love I think is why there's a heart beating in my chest. I think that's why I'm in this room, in this community, either for the first time or the thousandth time. Costly love for a priceless joy. My friends, that's what the text is about. That's what Acts of the Apostles is about. And hear me, that's the whole story of Christianity, y'all. That's the whole story. That's the gospel story. Jesus comes. The incarnation is costly love for a priceless joy. A life of self-deprivation and self-sacrifice was costly love for a priceless joy. The cross itself, the cross itself was costly love for a priceless joy. I know because the book that can't lie says in Hebrews 12, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who (laughs) for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. He knew the cost of loving us would be great, but the joy of having you home was priceless, and he signed it without hesitation. That's your call, y'all. That's the call. Harvest, may you be the people who receive the costly love of Jesus perfectly displayed at the cross. And Harvest, may you experience priceless joy being sent by him. May you refuse to settle for the buzz of base camp when he is calling you upward and onward into what he's doing in the world. What a moment to be alive. What a moment to be alive and I'm honored to be in it with you. Lord Jesus, I pray the simplicity of your costly love would be before us. God, as as Pierce comes to lead us through a moment to recognize communion, God, may we refuse to let this moment be the repetition of a ritual but the remembrance of your costly love. And Holy Spirit, I pray that people in this room who have never put their faith in you before, God, would do that in this moment. The Holy Spirit, you would just help them understand their need for forgiveness, their need for healing, and the availability of those things in you, Jesus. I pray that they would pray clumsy prayers. Lord, here I am, I'm sinful and broken, but I'm putting it together that you have done everything necessary for me to be forgiven and brought home to you. And I wanna be a part of what you're doing in the world. I pray people would pray simple prayers like that, that it would change their forever. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would empower my Harvest family for the great sending that you are preparing them for. May they never settle for base camp. May you take them all the way to the summit. God, thank you that on the top of another mountain, we find the cross, our constant reminder of your love for us. And thank you for the moment to remember it together now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said together, amen. I love you guys. So on the night that he signed the check, on the night that Jesus said, the joy of having my sons and daughters at home is worth the cost of what I'm about to go through without hesitation. He gathered with those that he had been with closest for the last three years. As he remembered the Exodus story of his father's salvation over the Hebrew people, he himself was setting up the ultimate salvation. On the night they gathered his disciples, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you, given for you, lavishly receive. At the end of the supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave thanks to it and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. The only one who can give a new covenant is who wrote the original covenant. He said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this, all of you. And so we do. We gather 2,000 years later to remember 
but we also know that this is not just simple bread and juice and, and, and moments and symbols, but that God's presence is with us in this. That there is no distance in the kingdom of God. There is no time expansion in the kingdom of God. And so in an act of faith, we join in with the disciples around the table 2,000 years ago in this moment. And we come together to receive. Those of us, all of us, who are not yet perfected, but we are covered in the one who is perfect who is seen by the Father because of what Jesus does on the cross and the resurrection, we now are seen perfected in his Son, and the Holy Spirit lives within us. So friends, you have been freely given. Today, come and freely receive. This table is open to all who would say, I am in need of a Savior, and the Savior I am in need of is the Son of God, Jesus, the Messiah. So as I pray, if you're serving communion today, if you'll come, get your elements and go ahead and go to your spaces um, and then the ushers will lead us forward to receive communion. Let us pray. So Jesus, we thank you. We give you praise and honor and glory. We lift your name high above every other name. We, we know that you are calling us into the deeper waters. You are sending us out. But may we not get it confused that any of it is done in our strength, but only because we have received you fully. And so Holy Spirit, in the mystery of faith, will you inhabit this bread and this juice that they may become for us the body of Christ and the blood of Christ broken and shed and poured out so that as we receive it, we may become like Jesus. That as we enter to the world and we enter back into our own story as we leave this room, that we not only receive the love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, but we also give it generously and lavishly to your people. So we thank you, we honor you, we worship you. In your name we pray, amen. As your ushers um, lead and guide you, if you will come forth to uh, receive communion, and if you have to leave after that, we understand, be blessed, be a blessing. Come and receive Holy Communion.